I'm getting smarter all the time. Stanley, you handsome here. devil. There we go. I already said enough about Stan Goldenberg. Anybody to go up in a plane in a hurricane, it's got to be nuts. How do we get rid of this one? Good afternoon. It is, let me start off while I'm, I'm opening this up. I'm starting my timer now. It is a pleasure, an honor to be here. I want you to know that uh, our public affairs person at the lab uh, was uh, asking me, uh, was this from the Heartland Institute? Hold it. <laughs> I got to concentrate on my passport for one second. Okay, we got it up there, good. And was asking, was this from the Heartland Institute? And I wrote back, basically I said, of course, because there's no other group that has ever put together a meeting like this. And I, I remember how thrilled, I, yeah, you can applaud them, absolutely. Those of us who have been dealing with this scientist, you have three research meteorologists here uh, who have, all of us have done extensive research. We don't just study and then just take a few classes. You dig in the data and you dig in the data and you understand the data and you write papers and do all sorts of things. They've done 10 times more than I have. But, but the issue is these are real research meteorologists. There's many people out there that have been fighting this. And I remember when they had the first conference back in 2007, 2007, I think. And I was so thrilled to see a critical mass of scientists really come together who could talk about this. And we don't walk in lockstep. Uh, you know, we each have our opinion with this, but it's really presenting the other side, which the media tends to censor. And by the way, just to mention, I'm here on my own time. I'm not necessarily representing NOAA. I work for NOAA, but they don't censor us. I don't want to give that impression. I do in my own time because I'm so far behind on my regular work that I couldn't justify coming up here, so I took leave. But, uh, but they really let us speak. It, I mean, my public affairs officer just encourages me, just say the science, stick to the science, stand, stick to the science. So I try and do that. And it's an honor also to be with Dr. Gray here, who's also always been an encouragement to me. And it's not just that he's a scientific expert, and some people might disagree with some stuff, he disagrees with them. But the issue is it takes guts to do and be outspoken like he has and like many of the people here have been. So uh, with that uh, introduction, do, and by the way, I'll mention I have a few handouts I put on the table there, including my most frequently asked question, <laughs> what will the 2012 hurricane season be like? And uh, in Inglés y Español, and uh, for some, just a limited number of handouts. Now, what I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about whether the trends that we saw in temperatures are anthropogenic or not. That's not the purpose of this talk. It's to talk about impact. And so the issue is we've observed a long-term warming trend in the tropical ocean. The reason I say observed is because all observations have their problems. And that's the whole trick with research is you just take a bunch of data on a piece of paper and do a statistical analysis. You can deceive yourself to no end if you don't understand how that data was how the data were obtained. And I'm just going to refer to here as global warming, GW. That doesn't mean it's AGW, Al Gore warming. Uh, and, uh, well, of course, man-made warming is M-A-N-N -N, uh, for Michael Mann. And no one is certain how long, no one is certain, okay? They have all their guesses and projections how long the warming will continue and how much more will warm. And, of course, their projections are based primarily on global climate models with increased CO2. I want you to know as far as climate models, okay, there's no reliable method yet model, statistical otherwise, to reliably predict a major climate event, El Nino, even one or two months in advance. Dirty little secret there, okay? I mean, they're making more uh, strides in understanding El Nino, but they can't predict something like that one or two months in advance, and they're wanting me to believe a climate model projecting 50 years, 70 years in advance. Enough said on that. The historical results here are based on associations with a long-term warming trend, whatever the source is. And the biggest problem in using the data that you've got to be more, most careful about is the temporal and spatial non-homogeneity of the hurricane database. Big phrase there, but it's the issue at keep the observational platforms, our understanding of the observations, the instruments on the aircraft, the instruments keep changing. Where we're measuring keep changing. So you cannot, like I said, go in there and just take the numbers. And 
the, so the issue is have the current levels of, of activity been affected by global warming? Now, I don't just study in a lab. As he said, I go out there and fly. I was on the Hurricane Katrina landfall flight. We could see this, the uh, Superdome, as it called, in the eye when we were flying over it. And uh, that's actually with Chris Lancey uh, on the right there, who's uh, uh, one of Bill Gray's former students. And uh, these are all hurricane experts here. And we were in that flight. And, you know, what was the disaster from? I mean, front page, Time Magazine. And Bill Gray and I were interviewed in that article. We were the skeptics at the end, because this is it. You know, man is making hurricanes stronger. Come on now, was it a disaster? Because, by the way, it got the weaker side of the storm. And was the disaster from global warming, or was it from the levees? I mean, let's be real here. Um, and, and by the way, I also study them on the ground in different ways. I went through the brunt of Hurricane Andrew. Uh, my house was totally destroyed with me and my three kids, brother and sister-in-law, their three kids in it. And in the hospital, by the way, the night before, my fourth child, my first daughter, Pearl, was born, and she's right over there, and she's almost 20 years old because we're in the 20th anniversary of Andrew. Stand up, Pearl, one second. You have to do it. She's going she's gonna to shoot me later. And, uh, but I'm telling you, that you're talking about one of those pictures is a concrete poured steel rod reinforced gable end ripped in pieces, and we were in the house when this happened. So I've experienced hurricanes all sorts of ways. But let me talk about what changes the amount of hurricane activity in the Atlantic. And this complicated diagram just talks about a lot of the different climate factors, Atlantic sea surface temperatures, sea level pressure anomalies. And I like to think of it as a sluice gate that kind of opens and closes to allow the easterly waves coming off of Africa to intensify or not. And one of the main things that controls that sluice gate is the vertical shear. Vertical shear, which can be affected by the uh, El Nino, La Nina, by impacts over Africa, but it's that vertical shear. And what's vertical shear? If you don't understand with hurricanes, it's the difference in the upper and lower level winds. And a hurricane likes to organize in the vertical like a chimney. So when you have a weak difference between upper and lower level, it can organize in that way. But if that difference gets strong, it starts to rip the storm apart. So you can have sea surface temperatures boiling away underneath that storm, and you have strong vertical shear in the atmosphere, you are not going to get a hurricane. No way, no how. It's not just the oceans. And I'll say that again and again. How is the hurricane activity changed? This is net tropical cyclone activity, which was actually developed by Bill Gray's group. It's an overall measure of activity. It takes the numbers, the strength, the duration of all the storms, and uh, that little pink dotted line above that, we call it hyperactive. And you can see how in the 50s and the 60s, and even some before, you had a number of hyperactive years, a lot of years above average. Then all of a sudden, you had this period for 24 years, not a single hyperactive year, and most of them below average. And suddenly, 1995, uh, maybe the year Al Gore was born, I don't know, but 1995, hyperactive, hyperactive. Now, I believe the difference between the latter and the former is you didn't have satellite in the previous active era. There was plenty of things we did not observe. But this, you can see, is a clear cycle in activity. What causes the cycle? This is from a uh, paper published in the Journal of Science, which is co-authored by Dr. Bill Gray, Chris Lancey, um, Alberto Messis Nunes, and myself. And basically, it's, it looked back at ocean records all the way back to the 18... 1800s and saw this clear multi-decadal mode, some people call it AMO, uh, and you have the high activity era, HAE, low activity era, those are associated with uh, hurricane activity in the Atlantic, just modulates it. But it's not the sea surface temperature itself because the increased sea surface temperatures don't automatically mean more hurricanes. That's very important, especially the major hurricanes. It takes the changes, like I said, in the atmospheric circulation. And in a paper by uh, Dr. Lloyd Shapiro and myself, uh, we showed that the direct impact of the sea surface temperatures, in other words, just the sea surface temperatures being warmer under the storm, accounts only 10% of the variability. It's how they're associated with the atmospheric circulation changes. And I hope I get to a certain, uh, a certain study a little bit later to show you more with that. The second highest observed sea surface temperature a few years ago, I got seven minutes on my call. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, it, in the uh, main development region, uh, almost as high as 2005, but the, you know, the average, the activity was only average. And then you even had 97 with warm SSTs, but you had a big El Nino, hardly any activity. The key is the atmospheric circulation. See how much I can get through here. Uh, this shows the fluctuations in the vertical shear. Now, all I'm going to say with that is up 
is, is weak shear, and down is, I'm sorry, up is, uh, yeah, weak shear, and down is stronger shear. And you can see it just goes up and down with a small decadal signal. Now, what happened, then came the debate, 2005, Webster in the Journal of Science, same journal, you know, he analyzed the global numbers of, of uh, category four and five tropical cyclones and showed they nearly doubled in the past 35 years. And if you look in the bottom, you see, yes, the sea surface temperatures have gone up and the storms have doubled. And the problem is, if you really look that since about 1990, those storms started to stay level, and that's when we started using a certain satellite analysis technique called the Dvorak technique. And yes, it was the worst observed type of storm was to know how many cat fours and fives, and that's the parameter, the only parameter he could find a change with. And all, all hell broke loose when he did the paper, because just because it's published doesn't make it true, and it was challenged by peer discussion, by published comments, and he started in 1970 to do satellite data, but the satellite data kept changing through the years. He ignored the natural variability. I'm just going to skip through this quickly. Then we get something else. And that the increased sea surface temperatures, like I said, don't automatically mean more storms. Problems with all of his basins, I just mentioned the East Pacific because I'm very familiar with that, is that in 1987, it was turned over to NHC. Before then, Redwood City analyzed that. And before NHC took over, the Hurricane Center, they reported only two tropical cyclones in all those years, greater than 125 knots. NHC took over, different analysis group, 10-fold increase. And I, I can go into the fact that wasn't climate, that was analysis. And then you had Kerry Emanuel come up with a study in Nature, 2005. The storms in the Atlantic, you know, uh, the energy, his, his PDI, doubling, you know, unprecedented. And Chris Lancey fires back at him and says, you didn't deal with the endpoints properly. You suppressed the earlier data. And plus, he kind of started it at a low point in the Atlantic cycle. So uh, we had other studies come out by uh, Bell and Chalaya, and they're with the NOAA Seasonal Outlook team, which is actually coming out on Thursday, the new outlook. And, uh, and he showed that the, this multi-decadal mode is just associated with almost all the parameters, thank you, associated with hurricane activity in the tropics. It's just they're all linked together in this multi-decadal uh, signal. Uh, Klotzbach, who uh, Dr. Gray talked about, one of his colleagues, uh, he analyzed the global ACE, which is an overall measure of activity, since 1990. And even though sea surface temperatures were going up, the global ACE was going down. Uh, this study I just love, and that was because the satellite data keeps changing. So these people went and they kind of polluted the early data. They made the early data the same resolution as the older data, and they came out with no increase globally with uh, hurricane activity. But by the way, I, I can't read this right now, but the, uh, they sat there in the Atlantic because they started the study at a low point in 80, and they said, well, the Atlantic went up. Gee, why is the Atlantic getting impacted by global warming? They had to say it, and it was so ludicrous because it was obvious it was part of the multi-decadal signal. I, I'll just say on this that uh, this was studied by Knutson and colleagues, and the reason this is important, this kind of is the consensus right now with a lot of the hurricane meteorologists, I don't necessarily hold to this, but that the, what we're gonna see, this was a modeling study, a global modeling study, and if you look in the middle, I wish I could point that the overall number of storms in this study, the overall numbers actually decrease with global warming, but maybe a slight increase in the stronger storms. And I'm, excuse me, I'm skipping through quick, because I want to show this. This is just a very interesting study. It's an empirical orthogonal function analysis of global sea surface temperatures. And what it does, it pulls out this info, and it shows three modes of variability. And the first one is this global warming mode, long-term trend. And you know what? It's associated with increased shear, and they saw a decrease in landfalls associated with this. Then you have the El Nino mode, which goes up and down every few years. When it's El Nino, you suppress the activity. And then you have the multi-decadal mode. So you've got all these different variabilities going on. It's not just whether it's warmer, it's why it's warmer. And this is by Chris Lancey. This is a gem, thank you. This is a gem because it shows the percent of tropical cyclones that were observed each year in the Atlantic that struck land. And before you had recon, numerous years, 100%. That means the only storms they observed happened to have hit land. And as soon as you had satellite data in 1960, not a single year above about 80%. You know, that's, that speaks volumes. Look at this, 1933, which was hyperactive just like 2005, nothing observed out there in the Atlantic. And uh, he took out 
you show this large trend over a century of tropical storm data, large trend if you just take the numbers of tropical storms, but then if you remove, you account for the very short-lived storms they might not have observed before, the trend disappears. And in summary, I got to the summary, that's amazing. Uh, and if they post it, do they post the PowerPoints online still? Yeah, I've, I tucked a few slides in at the end, so you can look at those that I didn't include. And good. And what the summary, the historical studies, thank you, careful use of the reliable parts of the historical record find no long-term trend in the hurricane activity. Uh, the future model projections have mixed results. Skip down. The, but the problem is the tendency of some in the media, government, certain scientific circles is still to attribute almost any increase in natural disasters to Al Gore warming. If it's bad, it must be global warming. That's their mentality. And, you know, what does it matter to you? Do you really care if a hurricane's coming at you, if it's from global warming or from, you know, or from whatever it is, you've got to prepare, and we really need to focus more on understanding hurricane threat and preparedness. I thank you very much.